Welcome back to Discovering Patterns in the Microbiome. Today we'll be talking about 16S variable regions and how they influence the type of data that are often used to study microbiomes. Now, I mentioned before that the ribosomal RNA is uh, one of the most common types of gene that are used to characterize microbiomes. Here we're going to explain why and, uh, and how the data are actually generated. And this is going to be a little bit of a primer for the non-biologists who are watching. The, uh, to understand the cellular processes behind the microbiome data, you need to understand the central dogma, as it's called, of molecular biology, which, as stated by Francis Crick, is that molecular biology deals with the detailed residue-by-residue -residue transfer of sequential information. It states that such information cannot be transferred back from protein to either protein or nucleic acid. A simpler way of explaining this that people often use is DNA makes RNA and RNA makes protein. I've always thought it's a little weird to call this a dogma um, because that sounds kind of religious or like something you're supposed to believe in um, when really it's just a scientific theory that's strongly supported by evidence. Now we have the central dogma here that DNA uh, makes RNA and RNA makes protein, although um, in reality, RNA can actually act on itself uh, in many ways, including through the ribosome. So let's imagine that we're starting with a bacterial community. Uh, whoops. We're, we're starting with a bacterial community, and we have a few different bacterial cells. Each of these has a little genome in it. And there are a couple different ways that we could try to sequence this DNA. So the first one we talked about, option one, is shotgun sequencing. And that's where um, we basically grind up all of the DNA uh, and sequence as much of it as we can afford. So we get these little pieces. They tend to be very short, maybe 100 or 200 nucleotides long. The challenge here is that each of these might come from a different gene in a different bug. So that, that piece could come from, say, uh, bug one, gene one, and this piece might come from uh, bug two, gene two, and this piece might come from bug two again, but a different gene, gene three. What we're left with is uh, basically each, uh, each sequence comes from a different gene, potentially a different bug. And what, uh, what we're trying to do then is compare uh, apples and, uh, you know, versus oranges. In the uh, alternative approach, which is using marker gene sequencing, and in, in particular we often use 16S sequencing, we're looking for a way to compare apples to apples. So we want the same gene from every bug. Now, um, what Carl Woese was thinking about when he came up with this approach was, okay, what's something that every bug has? In fact, everyone has. Everybody needs to have a ribosome. So the ribosome um, is basically just this blob um, that's made up of um, a couple of long strands of RNA and um, and then those strands of RNA are decorated by lots of uh, smaller proteins, a few dozen proteins. And then what the ribosome does is it takes pieces of RNA that were transcribed off of the genome, it chews them up, and out the other side, it spits out amino acids, making protein. Any one of the genes that make up the ribosome might be a good marker gene because all bugs have it, um, and, or in fact, all uh, organisms have ribosomes. The one that people have focused on is uh, this particular one called the 16S gene. Um, it's about 1,500 nucleotides long. Uh, the S here, um, the S, by the way, uh, stands for Svedberg. Um, 
it's actually, it relates to how long it takes the molecule to sediment through a uh, fluid when it's being centrifuged. Um, it's actually a unit of time, uh, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. And the, so what happens is these pieces of RNA never get translated into protein. So they're not messenger RNA. We call them R RNA, so ribosomal RNA. And what happens when they come out is that um, they actually have very strong secondary structure, meaning that um, the, these R RNA molecules, they have sections that, um, that line up very well together. So it's sort of like a palindrome. And as soon as the thing gets transcribed off the DNA, it, it uh, collapses down on itself, and those palindromic regions match up. And this actually makes a much larger, uh, more complicated structure you know, with lots of these little hairpin, um, hairpin loops and, and so on and so forth. And um, then once it's made that secondary structure, those structures fold into a 3D structure, and then that forms uh, this, this part of the ribosome. So, um, so the, way that, uh, the way that this gene works, some parts of it are structurally extremely important for the ribosome to work. Other parts are a little bit less important. So um, what happens is, if you look at the whole length of this gene, going from the start at position zero to the end at position approximately 1500, and you plot the percent of bugs that have the same DNA at each position from 0 to 100, you'll see that for, for a section, it'll tend to be very well conserved. And then all of a sudden, you'll get to a highly variable region where um, if there's a mutation, the ribosome still works. So uh, these tend to mutate much, much faster than the conserved regions. Then you get to another section that's highly conserved. So this is a portion where the function is extremely important. If a, a, a little bug is born with a mutation there, the ribosome probably doesn't work, so it just dies. Um, and then you go back to another variable region, and then another conserved region, and then another variable region, and another conserved region, and so on. Um, and uh, these are called V1, V2, V3, V4, up to V9. The whole sequence is too long for most DNA sequencers. So what we want is to find a portion of the whole sequence that's maybe a couple hundred bases long that will be really useful for figuring out what species a bug is from. So we don't want to pull in just a portion that's highly conserved, because then it won't have any information. It'll just be the same in every bug. Um, if we pick a region that's too variable, then perhaps, uh, perhaps there are so many changes that happen even between uh, two bugs in the same family that we can't really tell that they're from the same family. So it's nice to have a section that spans a little bit of a conserved area and some variable area. The other thing that we need to make this, this approach work is we have to have a way to fish out the portion of the gene that we want. So um, remember, we're not just grinding up DNA and sequencing it. We're going to somehow extract this one gene, make lots of copies of it, and then send that through the DNA sequencer. To do that, you have to have a little DNA probe that lines up on the beginning and another probe at the end of that section that you want to sequence. So the, one of the most common segments that people sequence is uh, right here in this variable 4 region. And that means that we need to find a little uh, sequence of DNA that's going to match that conserved region and another sequence that's going to match the conserved region on the other end. So that's the nice thing about having the two conserved regions there is that because they're approximately the same across all bugs, uh, 
um, you can design a DNA probe that's going to match up with most bugs, although it actually misses quite a few, and that, that's a very active area of research. So these little probes are really just DNA sequences. You actually manufacture a little molecule of DNA that's like 12 or 15 bases long. And, uh, you know, so this could be A, C, C, T, A, G, G, T, 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 A, C. This other one, you know, G, G, C, T, A, C, C, G, T, A, blah, blah, blah. And um, you mix those in, you grind up the DNA, mix those into the um, PCR reaction, and then when you run the PCR through all of its cycles, basically everything that got matched by those probes gets lots of copies made of it uh, exponentially more than uh, all the rest of the DNA, which basically um, gets, uh, gets overcome by the signal of the 16S. So, um, so now, when we finish running the PCR, we have a whole bunch of DNA molecules, each of which came from a different cell in the original bacterial community, and, um, and they're all lined up. So they all start at the first probe and end at the second probe. Actually, uh, in reality, usually what's happening is um, we have two sequences. So uh, there's a forward sequence, which starts with the first probe, the forward probe, and a reverse sequence, which started in the other direction with the reverse probe. And then um, depending on where those probes lined up in a, a gene, you might actually get some overlap between the sequences and you can stitch them together computationally and get a longer sequence to work with. But the net result is the same, which is that we've got the same little portion of a gene from a bunch of different cells in the input environment. And now um, we basically have all of these sequences that um, that we want to analyze. How many? Well, a typical sequencing run uh, might, uh, on a, this is an Illumina MySeq run, uh, might generate 10 million or so um, sequences. That's too many features. Um, there's also, also a lot of sequencing error, and there's some error introduced in the amplification step too. So we need to have some way of collapsing that variation and basically extracting some kind of more uh, condensed features. So usually what we do is we will cluster or bin these sequences together according to similarity. So we look for groups of them um, that are pretty similar to each other. The most common threshold that's used is 97% uh, similarity within each cluster. Then we call each of these an OTU. Um, so these are OTUs, stands for Operational Taxonomic Taxonomic uh, Unit or OTU. And uh, we have no idea what these are, so we just label them arbitrarily. Let's call all of these sequences OTU1. These will be OTU2, OTU3, OTU4, and so on. And those are the features that go into our data table at the end. Once you've done that, now you've gone from a million or 10 million or 100 million sequences down to, say, a thousand different OTUs. So now it's something that you could put in an Excel spreadsheet you can try to figure out which OTUs are associated with disease or with the health of your environment. Um, and, uh, and you can try to figure out what species each of them comes from. Now, um, this is the approach that I mentioned earlier is analogous to looking for a certain piece of those um, jigsaw puzzles, each jigsaw puzzle representing a different bug's genome where we know the same type of piece exists in all the genomes. So if you could pick out the bottom right corner piece of every puzzle, then you could basically say, OK, all the ones that kind of look like ocean, let's bend them together and say that's an ocean-y type of puzzle. All the ones that look like a flower, 
uh, let's bin them together and call it a flowery type of puzzle. Although, of course, um, you, as, as is evident from this picture, knowing what is in the bottom right corner doesn't really tell you um, a whole lot about what's in the rest of the puzzle. So, um, so that's one of the main limitations with this type of technique. And uh, you also, you might have two quite different puzzles that both happen to have a blank piece or a mostly white piece in the bottom right corner, so you can't really tell them apart. Another big issue with this type of data. As I mentioned, we can actually make the shotgun sequencing approach work. And that's because enough bacteria have been sequenced, uh, sorry, their whole genome has been sequenced and placed in a giant database that if we take the shotgun approach, um, it does still cost more money, although not so much more. But we can still, we can now take the um, individual pieces of genes and just find which box top it matches. So now we know um, both what species are there and approximately what genes are there. We get a better picture of the overall content, uh, you know, what, what uh, all of the puzzles look like, not just that one little representative piece from each puzzle. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we get these very big data tables, and the features here can either be the OTUs, so those are those little clusters of sequences um, that we generated, they could be species labels, and that could either mean um, for each OTU you took a guess about which species it came from, and then all the OTUs from the same species, you just kind of add them together. Or that can come from the shotgun sequencing data where um, you've, you've taken every single sequence, found out what species it probably came from, and then you just count up how much of each species it came. Or you could tabulate um, how many of each gene or each type of gene was seen in the data. And you can also collapse genes into functional pathways, and there are a few other, uh, few other data types you can have here. 